We're so blessed with his love and his grace in our life. And we've had some pretty cool stories of what went on with Wes with surgery here this last week. I'm so thankful. And, um, I couldn't stay away because John's not just any old guy. He's the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance, which I'm a part of that movement. been a part of that movement for 30, oh, I guess 40 years. And I'm so grateful that John and Joanna are here. And um, what a great song to introduce him because he's going to be giving us a real tour of what's going on in the field. You remember the last four or five weeks you've had a theme verse in Romans, right? Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and you know what God's will is, is good, pleasing, perfect will. Well, we were just singing a song. He, he always said, pray for workers of the harvest. And we're going to hear about some of those workers who have offered themselves, literally, as a living sacrifice. And I'm so grateful that John's here, his brother in Christ, but God has called him, put his mantle on him, to be over the Christian Missionary Alliance right now, and using him to help us to get into unreached people groups in the world. So it's going to be pretty fascinating, and I'm excited to have him come. So John, if you want to get ready, I want to pray for you, brother. Father, I just thank you so much for my brother John and his wife Joanna. I just ask God today that your blessing, your goodness, your love, your grace, even as you've done so many amazing things in, in their life, Lord, that you would use him today. And that our hearts might get caught as we hear about the harvest, as we hear about what's going on with the workers who have offered themselves as a living sacrifice. I pray for your blessing upon everything that goes on and that you would open our hearts to see our part. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. And that's very classic Danny Hodges to pull himself out of bed and get over here just to say hi. But thank you, thank you, Danny. Good to see you all today. Uh, I'll give a few introductory comments just to uh, get us going, and then I want to dive into a passage of scripture. And then, as Danny said, yes, we'll take on a quick world tour. But we're, we're here in uh, Arizona this week because of two very special people. <laughs> two grandsons live in Phoenix, a one year old and a three year old. And so, oh, yes, they have parents as well, our daughter and son in law. But you know what it is, to, uh, many of you to uh, enjoy grandkids. So. They live in Phoenix, and so we were in the area. I uh, thought, well, going to be in the region. Maybe Danny will let me uh, uh, crash this party and uh, come uh, meet this group. You, you are part of this bigger family of churches. You may or may not be aware of that, but there's 2,000 Alliance churches like this one worshiping Jesus in the United States today, and 37 different languages here in the United States. We're that complex. It's a complex family that you're part of, but we enjoy it. Uh, Get the, my wife, Joanna, is with me, and we uh, do this most weekends. Uh, we're somewhere in the United States uh, in some um, church, just uh, getting to know the family and uh, explaining what God's up to. So uh, this gives us joy. Uh, my main claim to fame here, Casa Grande, if you are a more than five-year veteran of this church, you may remember a woman named Darlene Vanette who played beautifully on the piano, sang beautifully, led worship here. That's my sister. Uh, she was uh, here for a season, and um, part of the beauty of being uh, part of this Alliance family is, is um, you have others to reach out to. So when Harry, uh, a much loved pastor here, moved on, uh, Pastor Harry, uh, you didn't have to just start from scratch and figure out uh, where do we go to get a preacher. <laughs> you had a network already established of vetted candidates and. A, superintendent to help you walk through that. So that was part of the benefit of being uh, part of a family, to have somewhere to turn in time to transition. But I want to tell you another benefit of being part of the family today, and, and that's this world mission that we are on together. To launch that, I want us to open our Bibles, and they'll be on the screen as well, to a very well-known passage of Scripture, Acts chapter 1. But I think maybe the Lord will give us some insight today that uh, you just haven't quite thought of it uh, to this degree. So you know what's happened, right? Though Jesus has given his life for us. We're grateful for that provision of salvation that he provided on the cross. He rose the dead, providing for us the 
joy and freedom of eternal life. And now he's having one last conversation with the disciples. And if you have one last question you got to ask of Jesus, one last chance to look Jesus in the eye and ask him a question, I'm not sure what you would ask, but we do know what they asked. And I find three mistakes in their question. Now, careful here. I don't find any mistakes in the Bible. The Bible is a perfect recording of what they asked, but they were disciples. They were Jesus. Jesus made no mistakes, but <laughs> we're his disciples, and we made mistakes, right? Well, and he's so kind. He's so kind. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't sat their hand and say stupid questions. No, no, no. He, he, he kindly corrects their false assumptions that they build into this question. So I want us to look for, very quickly, for three false assumptions, three mistakes they embed into their question, and then how Jesus kindly corrects them. And in that, we're going to learn some lessons for ourselves that are very applicable to, to our lives and this church today. So, are you good? Ready? All right. So, then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, so far so good. No mistakes yet, right? <laughs> Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? The first question they have is the timing question. And you know what Jesus says? It's not for you to know the times. Many of us think that we would love to know the future. Lord, when are you coming back? Or when is this going to happen? Or when do I get this answer to prayer? Last time I was here in this region, my wife and I were debating the exact time, but the last time we were in Casa Grande was just weeks before I became very ill. I was an ultramarathon runner, able to run 50, 60 kilometers, and in one week's time, I was no longer able to drive a car. I lost 50 pounds of muscle mass in a few weeks' time and went into the care of my wife and became my caregiver. I was in a wheelchair on a feeding tube, had to resign from my job, and that's a very long and sad story, but God uh, made it a very beautiful and rich story. I say that at this moment only to say, I would have had a horrible time there in Casa Grande <laughs> the week that I was here. Had I known what was just coming a few weeks later, now, there was nothing related to my being here, my getting sick, okay? Just don't, don't worry about that. I'm just simply saying, it would have ruined a perfectly good time, a vacation that was offered to us by one of the homeowners in this region. Uh, it would have ruined a perfectly good time if I had known this was one of the last times I'd have a family vacation with my family for a very long season. See, we're not big enough to know the future without it messing up the present. You with me? Only God is big enough to know the future and not have it mess up the present. So they want to know when, and he says, it's not for you to know the time. So mistake number one is a, is a when, a, a timing mistake. The second mistake they make, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? This is the question of the who, not the when. This is the question, or excuse me, of the what. The what, what are you going to do? Lord, are you going to give us our kingdom back? They, they thought the story was still about them. And they had forgotten all the Old Testament passages that would say things like, you will be a blessing to all the nations and all peoples on earth. And... So they thought the story was about that. They wouldn't be the first or the last people to think the story was just about them. And, and you see what he says? No, no, actually, um, I do care about Israel. You're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea. Well, that's the, that's the kingdom of Israel. And Samaria, oh, those are the people who live close to them who are not like them an increasing population of a diverse people group that has come into our own country. That would be Samaria, people who live close to us and have different language or cultural background, and all the way to the ends of the earth. Jesus' plan was for Israel, yes, yes, but not just for Israel. His heart was for the ends of the earth, all the way to Ohio, Pennsylvania. Right? 
we are the ends of the earth in that sense, or if you're starting in this room, but, but today, starting here, we would, we would say, start where you are, start in your town, Jerusalem, the surrounding region, the rival sports team, Samaria, again, people who oppose to us or not like us, all the way to the ends of the earth, and that's the world tour that will take us on. So their second mistake was this, the, the, the scope of his plan, the, uh, the, the mission that the Christ was on. They saw it in a very small way, and he saw it in a global context. They thought it was just for them, and he wanted them to know, no, 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 this is for everyone. Third mistake. Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Lord, what are you going to do? <laughs> How many people are asking that question today? God, what are you going to do about this? All these problems, all these issues, all these... Lord, what are you going to do? And do you notice what Jesus' answer is? I can almost hear him clearing his voice. Like, <clears throat> well, actually... You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and beyond. You hear what's happening here? One you going up with him and three years coming back to them. Now, now it's not that he's not going to do anything. Can you see what he does? I'm going to send you my Holy Spirit. Oh, that's the biggest thing of all that he can do. He can the very power that enabled him to do what he did on earth now is being given to us. So the giving of the Holy Spirit, that's what he's going to do. I will give you my power. I will send you my spirit. But then you have the responsibility. You are my plan. You are the ones who are going to use. Oh, that changes the story, doesn't it? When we long for God to do everything, we're really missing out on how he works in this world. That most of the work of God that gets done in this world is through people like us. Right? I, I got to be in uh, the Philippines a couple years ago and was speaking at a conference there. You, you have um, 2,500 sister churches worshiping Jesus today in, in the Philippines. And uh, they had a large conference, run in an auditorium, held about 4,000 people, and had those big jumbotron kind of screens. You know what I mean? The kinds that have to be lit up electrically, like in a sports stadium. Not, not these that have a projector shining on it, but those that lit up the dependent And, and um, I was speaking all week and didn't plan on any PowerPoint, but they asked me on the last day to give a presentation where I had 18 photos and a video, and I really needed the screens, and I showed up and the screens weren't working. And I wasn't, didn't want to be the impatient American, so I bit my tongue for a little bit. But then the worship leader got up and had to do the say a line, sing a line, say a line, sing a line, because there were no lyrics on the screens, and now I'm getting nervous. And so I say to the tech director guy, hey, what's happening? And he says, no electricity. Uh, I don't know what no electricity means in Manila, but this doesn't sound like very good news to me. Uh, they need more than a couple of double-way batteries to fire up those things, so I prayed with my eyes open. And the whole screen lit up, or excuse me, the whole screen just had little flashes of digital nonsense and then went back again. Well, I was sitting next to a guy from a Mr. Spiritual Warfare, a friend of mine, and uh, I said, Don, I need those screens. Pray. And uh, so he closed his eyes and did this. He's, he's rebuking demons. I don't know. And, and demons can live in pigs. Maybe they can live in screens. I don't know. I don't know. But I kept my eyes open. And the whole screen lit up brightly with digital nonsense and then went black again. I said, well, you got more than I did, buddy. <laughs> now it's my time to preach. And I am distracted. Black, 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 black. Finally, I just got. And I said to the crowd, I'm about to need those screens very badly. You've noticed they haven't worked all morning. Would you break into prayer huddles and just pray that God will give us those screens? I wish I had set my stopwatch because within five minutes or less, those screens lit up, worked perfectly the entire rest of the service. Now, why do I tell you that story? Because it's a fun story to tell. And 
Dan, you'll appreciate this, but you have a one flicker president. Never mind, think about that later. But, but anyway, um, the point of the story is this. A year later, a Filipino woman came running up to me here in the United States and said, do you remember when he spoke in the Philippines? Oh yeah, yeah, I had a wonderful time. You were very hospitable. Do you remember that day that the screens didn't work? Oh, I remember it very clearly. And do you remember how you had his face? She's retelling me the whole story. And then she said something I did. She said, we're, we're still telling that story in the film. Why? Because it became their story. Right? Right, right, right? If God had answered my prayers, I would have a story to tell. Or God's my prayers, we would have a story to tell. But the kingdom of God rarely advances in this world through one leader or a couple of appointed people. You have a great pastor. We love Danny. Fantastic. But it was never the plan. It's never been the plan for God to use just one or two people. It's always been the plan for all of us who are followers of Christ to be empowered and to be his servants. Because there are prayers that you can pray that nobody else can think of praying. And there's, there's love that you can show that nobody else can show because of the certain relationship that you can have. And there's words that you can say because nobody else can say those words quite like you can say them. And there's money you can give that nobody else can give because it's your money. You can't give somebody else money, you can only give your money. And there's there's time that you have that nobody else has because it's your time. And so, so this is just the way it works in God's kingdom that when we all offer ourselves to him, he gives us the power of the Spirit and then says, you have an assignment. You have a part of this. There's something for you. So that's what I see in this passage, obviously very briefly. But we don't get to know the timing. That's in his category. We just, you know what that means? We have to trust him. <laughs> Ooh, once again, we're put in a place of trust. So, so we don't get to know the timing. We do get to know the mission. He cares about where we live, our town, our region, people who are close to us who are not like us, and he wants our mission to go to the farthest extents of this planet, because Jesus cares about everyone, and he wants to use us as part of it. That's a quick run through of Acts 1.16. Now, let me uh, take this. Here's this family that you're part of uh, is, is, on, is serious about uh, seeking to fulfill this. And am I in control now? I am. Wow. Am I going to go places I want to go? Pray for us or leave us out. Good job, We come from every background you can think of who have hearts for Jesus. That is what the Alliance is and was. It started that way. We have a power, what we've been talking about lately, it's our outreach here in our community and beyond. But what, I want to do something different this year. Um, the Great Commission Fund is something we support personally as a body of Christ. Every one of you support it if you get here. We give a portion of our income to help the missionaries stay on the field where we are. But this year, I've been wanting to do something a little bit different. It worked out perfect to have John here on the first Sunday of December. But by Christmas, I want us to do a love offering that will go solely to 100% of it to the Great Commission Fund. So you have from now and until we get through the end of the month of December as we do that. And we'll send that in uh, to go to the Great Commission Fund. You know, every time we do something like that, it supports somebody on the field. Isn't it something? You see all the faces and the people, and you got to hear just very few of the stories. I mean, there's just millions of stories of what God is doing in places that we can't do. But one of the important things I heard years ago that was always stuck with me, what we do here, by if we can't go physically, we can hold the ropes through prayer, and we can hold the ropes through helping them stay on the field through giving. Remember what we talked about a while back on Where's Our Treasure? Right? Where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. And one of the things we've been pushing on here, and you know me, I've been pushing on you, that we would have a heart for everyone. That we would do everything we can, every way we can, to reach as many people as we can. And my saying has always been, I'm going to slide in sideways all used up for the kingdom, for Jesus. May that be true of us as a church, as a congregation. It takes all of us. 
So I just want to encourage you. I'm just going to pray for us in closing. So we have from now, this day, to the end of December, we're going to do everything we can to raise some funds. And I, I pray it will be just a great celebration of what we are able to do. But to give that solely to the Great Commission Fund. We're going to trust God with it. And we're going to hear more stories. And we'll start showing some video clips and some different things about what God is doing in some of these places. So let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for my brother John and his wife Joanna. Thank you for how he's leading this particular movement, Lord, the Christian Missionary Alliance that I'm so blessed to be a part of, Lord. That's what drew me from the very beginning is their heart for lost people all over the world, not just in America, but across the world. Lord, so many of those pictures, I recognize the people in those pictures, Lord, that I've known, been a part of. Uh, the one in particular, and I'm not going to say their names, but we were up at 2.30 in the morning praying over them just the other day, Lord, and, and you put them on our heart. And I just ask Jesus that you would move our hearts in such a way that this Christmas season, our gift would be to give so that missionaries can go where we can't go and to pray for them and to trust that we'd see literally hundreds and thousands of people come to faith in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, I, I just pray your blessing upon each one. I just love this body. Thank you so much for their hearts for you and for what I know you want to do through us and in us. And may you accomplish your purpose and your will. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Lord bless you. Have a great day. Stay with you.